أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده ونسبحه ونقدسه على آلائه ونعمائه ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل وسلم اللهم صل وسلم وبارك وترحم على محمد وآل محمد كأفضل ما صليت وسلمت وباركت وترحمت على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد وصل اللهم وسلم على أصيائه وخلفائه وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وعلى من تبعهم بإحسان وإيمان إلى قيام يوم الدين عباد الله أوصيكم ونفسي بتقوى الله عز وجل ولزوم أمره قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والذين جاهدوا فينا لنهدينهم سبلنا وإن الله لمع المحسنين آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم الله صلى الله It's a common practice around the world that at the beginning of the year that individuals they take up New Year's resolutions and these resolutions uh, they vary in their quality and their quantity and they encompass a vast array of different types of resolutions some people who are trying to become physically fit and healthy physically others who are trying to be more spiritually and morally aware and so on and so forth and we notice that some individuals when they make these new year's resolutions they are in fact by the end of the year they are successful in implementing their resolutions while some others are not so successful some fail in the uh, implementation of their New Year's resolutions. I remember reading uh, recently about, uh, you know, someone had written that my resolution for 2014 is to accomplish that which I should have in 2013, which I should have done in 2012, which I promised to do in 2011 and plan to do in 2010, right? Some people, they end up just making resolutions just for the sake of making resolutions, but not falling through and actually succeeding in implementing their resolutions. I was reading an article in the, uh, in the newspaper, and this article was discussing the science behind successful New Year's resolutions. And the author mentioned that in the United States, about 54%, uh, I'm sorry, about 45% of Americans, they make New Year's resolutions on an annual basis. 45% of Americans. Now, this article presented both good news and bad news. The good news was that there was a study in the Journal of Clinical Psychology that says that individuals who make resolutions are 10 times more likely to change their behavior than those who have absolutely no resolutions whatsoever. This was the good news. The bad news is that in general, short-term urges, they trump long-term goals that people, because of short-term desires and urges, they end up failing. And it's said that about 54 or 56% of individuals who make uh, resolutions, they end up quitting at six months or before six months. And at the end of the year, an average of only 8% of people who made New Year's resolu resolutions are in fact successful, have implemented their resolutions. So why is it that so many people fail? 92% of people, they fail in implementing their New Year's resolutions. And not only do they continue 
to fail, but they continue to make New Year's resolutions year after year. They make the resolution and they fail. And again the next year they make a resolution and they fail. And so on and so forth. It's a recurring phenomenon. So why is this? So this article was discussing the science behind successful New Year's resolution. And the author, she said that there are two types of resolutions that always fail. Number one, the first type of resolution that always fails is that which is called the pie in the sky resolution. It's a resolution based on what? Based on false hope. It's based on false hope with no specific real strategy in order to implement. Some people, for instance, a prominent or popular resolution is to do what? Is to lose weight. Many people, they want to lose weight. And so at the beginning of the year, they say, you know what? This year, I'm going to lose 30 pounds, 40 pounds, right? Or someone might come out and say, this year, I'm going to get married. And the resolution is just words. They do not implement a specific strategy in order to lose those 30 or 40 pounds. And we know that the numbers on the scale, they remain the same. They don't change, right? And Mr. or Miss Wright doesn't just fall out from the sky. No, you have to go after it and pursue in order for you to accomplish this goal. And so many individuals, they end up doing what? They, make, they end up making pie in the sky resolutions. Resolutions which are just words and just claims and just hopes, but there's no specific strategy that is placed in order to implement these resolutions. And the famous saying says what? Saying that, uh, the saying says that uh, hopes are not a plan. Hopes without action are not a plan. It's important to be positive. I mentioned this in last night's lecture, Thursday night lecture, that it's important that we are positive in our lives. We express positivity. But this has to be based on what? On reality, on real steps that we take. So this is one type of resolution that always fails. The second type of resolution that always fails is what? Is that which is known as the all over the place resolution. A long laundry list of different resolutions that individuals they want to do. They say this year I want to get a new job, I want to get married, I want to go to Hajj, I want to get married again, uh, I want to make up 10 years of missed prayer and fasting, I want to learn a new language and I want to come to Friday prayers every week. It's a laundry list, a long list of resolutions and this seems exciting we want to do a lot we want to get a lot accomplished but this type of resolution is also problematic and usually fails why because experts tell us that our brain chemistry fails when it's put into overload because the basis of a successful resolution is what is self-control is determination and Self-control. And self-control, it's not an unlimited resource. It can be exhaustible. We can exhaust it. Yes, individuals, they vary in their capacity. Some people have more self-control and willpower than others. But in the end, it's all limited. All of us are limited. And so sometimes when we take up too much, we end up exhausting self-control. And as a result, nothing gets done. A study was done where two groups, participants were placed into two groups. In one group, the participants were given a series of tasks that required self-control in order to implement. The second group were given a series of tasks which did not require self-control to implement. After the test, the researchers did what? The researchers, they measured the blood glucose level of the participants of the different groups. And we know that the, uh, the, the blood glucose is what, basically? The glucose, it's basically fuel for our brains, right? It allows our brains to function and for us to be able to maintain our, our uh, cognitive abilities. And this is why 
Doctors usually tell those who have diabetes, who take the medicine, because the medicine that those diabetics take does what? It lowers their blood glucose level. For them, it's important to maintain the blood glucose level so that they can function. The, uh, uh, these, the researchers, they did what? The researchers then, they measured the blood glucose level of these two groups and they maintained and they found out what? They found that those who were in the self-control group had lower levels of blood glucose and as a result, they have less self-control. And so here, the author says that the second type of resolution that always fails is that which is all over the place. Are those multiple resolutions that we make, we just stack them and we do not, we are not able to fulfill them. Now the author also presents three ways to make and keep successful resolutions. She says, number one, that when you make a resolution, make sure to work on one resolution at a time. One at a time. In our society today, more and bigger is usually better, right? And this is evident in our homes and in our cars and in the buildings that we have and in some people's genes. Bigger is better, right? In fact, in the last case, I've mentioned this before, it's the other way around. Nowadays, skinny is, is what's up, right? So, more is better, but when it comes to goals, the goals are what? When it comes to goals, the less goals that we have, the more, the greater, because we are able to focus on this less amount of goals and come out with quality, uh, uh, with quality conclusions and results. There is a hadith, a famous hadith, that says that the best actions are those which are small but are consistent. They are small, they're not grandiose, they're not huge, they're not large, but they are consistent. The hadith says, That God loves that when one of you does something, he does what? He does it perfectly, he does it completely, that you don't stop the job on the way, you don't forfeit, you don't give up, that when you do something, you do it completely and successfully. And so it's important for us to choose what our priorities are. What's my priority? Is it wajib for me, for instance, as an example, is it wajib for me to perform the hajj? Do I have to perform the hajj? If this, if I am able to physically and financially, then this becomes my priority. Then this should be my resolution. Instead of stacking 10 different resolutions, I should focus on one, two, three, or four, and work on one at a time. This is number one. The second is to do what? The second is to translate our resolutions into specific behavior, and specific tasks. In other words, to break down, if there's something that you want to do, to break this down into simple tasks, to put it, to organize it, to put it into a timetable, and to begin to work on it. Some people, they would love to do what? To memorize the Qur'an. A lot of people, they thought about it in their lives, that they would love to memorize the Qur'an, right? But the Qur'an, to memorize the Qur'an is not something easy. It's a big task, it's not not easy it's very difficult right if we look at the verses of the Quran the verses of the Quran are over 6,000 verses 6,236 verses right and so in order to memorize the Quran it seems like it's a daunting task a huge task if you want to memorize the Quran you don't say this year in 2014 I'm going to memorize the Quran because it might be impossible with all of our other obligations and all of our other responsibilities it might be impossible so it's important to break this task into things that we are able to do, this resolution into tasks that we are able to implement. If you were to, in the case of the Qur'an, if you want to memorize one verse a day, it would take you what? It would take you over 17 years. If you want to memorize one ayah every single day, it would take up to 17 years. Now imagine if you want to memorize two verses a day. 
cut that time in half. If you want to memorize three verses a day, also four verses and, 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 and so on and so forth, right? Or in the case of studying, for instance, in the case of studying, some people, they, wanna, they would love to go to school, they would love to get you know, an education, but they are not able to. They have work, they have other things. If you want to, and if you are determined to do so, to break up the task into smaller tasks that we are capable of fulfilling. I remember when I was in Qom, when I was studying in Qom, that part of the, the classes and the, the um, instruction that I would, I would uh, learn, in addition to the face-to-face -face classes, the physical classes that I had, I would also listen to, to CDs and listen to lectures online as a supplement in order to add to the classes that I was taking. And this for me was a dreadful task, was a dreadful task because to be in class with the professor is one thing and to be listening to the professor talk, right? And your mind goes somewhere else and you begin to play with your phone and you begin to think about all of these things. It was very difficult. So I made sure that I put a specific program. I have to listen to this number of, of lectures online or on the CD a day. And I made sure that I put a specific timetable, a specific time. And if one day I did not listen to the number of classes that I had to, I would do what? I would punish myself. I would deprive myself of what? Of the afternoon nap. And for those in the Middle East, you know that you cannot go by during your day if you don't take an afternoon nap because everything shuts down. You can't do anything. You have to take a nap in the afternoon. And so it's important for us to break down and to translate this resolution into tasks that we are able to manage and to make a specific time. To make a specific time. If you want to memorize the Quran, if you want to memorize one, two, three, four or more verses of the Quran, to set a specific time, not to say today I will memorize for tomorrow. No, specifically, a specific time. When you're driving to work, for instance, or driving back home. Alhamdulillah, for those who live in California, especially in Southern California, especially in the area in Orange County in Los Angeles, you know that much of our time is spent behind the wheel. This time is a time that we can use to be productive, not just to waste just sitting behind the wheel, Perhaps this is a good time for us if we want to memorize the Qur'an, to spend this time memorizing the Qur'an. This is number two. And number three, the author says the third uh, way of implementing successful resolutions is to practice every single day. To make sure you do whatever it is you want to do every single day. In the case, in the world of sports, right? How is it that we're able to have these fantastic basketball players and baseball players and soccer players and football players? How are these athletes so great at what they do, right? Those who are able to participate in the Olympics and get the gold medals, how do they, how do they become like that? If you look into their lives, they practice probably on a daily basis. There's never a time in which they do not practice and they make sure that they do so. Because the amount of effort that we put in translates into what? Translates into results. The less effort we put in, the less results. The more efforts that we put in, the greater the results. And finally, number four, which I add to this list, is that we have to always ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for assistance. If we are determined to do something, if we have a resolution, we want to do something, yes, we do our part, and we, we, we are committed, but we have to also make sure that we have trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make things easier for us. Allah tells us, And those who struggle in the way of God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will lead them to their ways. We can all determine, each and every one of us can all determine where we need to grow in our life where it could be in our relationships with our spouse or children or parents or family members it could be in my relationship with Allah strengthening my relationship with Allah it could be working 
on performing my prayers, my fasting, my charity, making up those things that I may have missed. Maybe it might uh, require me to work on, you know, some of my characteristics and attributes if I'm an angry person to work on lessening that, to controlling that, and so on and so forth. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Almighty, to give us the capacity to do so. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wal-Asr. Inna al-insana lafi khusr. Illa al-ladheena amanu wa amilu al-salihati wa tawasaw bil-haqqi wa tawasaw bil-sabr. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده ونسبحه ونقدسه على آلائه ونعمائه ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد أرسله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك وترحم على محمد وآل محمد كأفضل ما صليت وسلمت وباركت وترحمت على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد وصل اللهم وسلم على أوصيائه وخلفائه وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وعلى علي أمير المؤمنين وقائد الغر المحجلين وعلى البضعة الطاهرة فاطمة الزهراء سيدة نساء العالمين وعلى سبط نبي الرحمة وإمام الهدى الحسن والحسين سيدي شباب أهل الجنة وعلى أئمة المسلمين علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجعفر بن محمد وموسى بن جعفر وعلي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي وعلي بن محمد والحسن بن علي والخلف الهادي المهدي عجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف وجعلنا من أنصاره وأعوانه عباد الله أوصيكم ونفسي بتقوى الله عز وجل ولزوم أمره قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن الناس من يشري نفسه ابتغاء مرضات الله والله رؤوف بالعباد آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم Today is the first day of the month of Rabi' al-Awwal and history tells us that Rabi' al-Awwal, and especially the first of Rabi' al-Awwal, is a very significant time because it marks when the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, migrated from Mecca to Yathrib, to Medina. And historians tell us that after the advent of Islam, Quraysh, they tried their best to do what? They tried to uh, uh, extinguish the light of Islam and they had many different tactics they placed the siege on the Prophet and Bani Hashim and his followers the Prophet peace be upon him had to leave Mecca towards al Ta'if where he was repelled there also the Muslims were sent to go to Habasha under the Christian king at the time and so on and so forth. There were many difficulties that the Prophet and the Muslim faced. And history tells us that the time came where Abu Jahl, one of the elders of Quraysh, where Abu Jahl, he decided that this was enough. That Islam was threatening the power of Quraysh and the power of the polytheists. And so he decided to gather and to bring forth, bring together the elders of Quraysh in Mecca in a place known as Darun Nadwa, in a place of assembly where the elders of Quraysh, they would constantly assemble, especially when they were faced with difficulties. And so he brought 40 members of the elders of Quraysh together from the different tribes of Quraysh he brought them together and he told them, he said, listen, we need to end this, the, the threat of Islam and the threat of Muhammad. He said, Muhammad is part of us. He is part of Quraysh. We respected him. 
When he was young, we called him what? We called him al-sadiq al-ameen, the truthful and the trust trustworthy because, because he was trustworthy. He was a good person. But then he made a claim that he is the prophet and messenger of God. And he caused division between us. And he is taking the power and influence that we have away from us. So we need to figure out what to do in order to put an end to this. And so they began to deliberate. They began to discuss. Some of them, they said that we should go and do what? We should go and kill Muhammad. Send an assassin to kill the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. But then they said what? They said we'll kill him. And then when Bani Hashim comes to ask for the blood money, we'll do what? We'll give them tenfold. To keep them quiet, we'll give them ten times the amount of the blood money. But then there was arguments between them. They said, no, this is not going to work. Why? Because Bani Hashim, they're not going to be satisfied with the blood money. You killed one of their members and one of their prestigious and honorable members. And so this will incite more hatred and violence and we will end up killing one another. All of Quraysh will end up killing one another. So then the, uh, they deliberated again. The second suggestion was that they would build a prison and they would place Prophet Muhammad in the prison and until he died. They would give him a little bit of food until he died. Now, also this plan was what? This plan was rejected because they said that the Arabs and the, the, the tribes, they come from different parts of you know, the world and different parts of the peninsula. They come here twice a year for the pilgrimage. Bani Hashim, when the time of the pilgrimage comes, Bani Hashim will come out and they will plead to the Arabs and the rest. They will tell them, come and help us rescue Muhammad and so he will be taken out. So this is not going to work. Let's think of another option. They said, let's exile him. Let's exile him. Let's take him out of Mecca. Let him go. But then this again was denied because they said, if we exile him, he's going to go. First of all, he's handsome. He knows how to talk. His ideas are great. He's eloquent. So he's going to go and he's going to have a lot of followers. And this is going to increase the threat. So we cannot do that either. And then Abu Jahal, historians, they tell us, he said, listen, I have the perfect idea. Let us get a member from every tribe of the Quraysh and all together we will go and assassinate Prophet Muhammad. And in this way, no one will be able, Bani Hashim, they will not be able to come and stand up against the entire Quraysh because the, 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 the fault and the guilt will be what? Will be dispersed and it will be lost amongst all of Quraysh. And they will not be able to stand up against uh, Quraysh. And in fact, they chose a member also from Bani Hashim, who was whom? The uncle of the Prophet, Abu Lahab, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, Tabbat yada, yada Abi Lahabin, Watab. He curses him in the Quran. So they went, they decided that they would go they made this plan and they decided that they would go to the home of Prophet altogether in order to assassinate him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he revealed the verse from the Quran. He revealed to the Prophet, chapter number 8, verse number 30, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَإِذْ يَمْكُرُ بِكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لِيُثْبِتُوكَ أَوْ يَقْتُلُوكَ أَوْ يُخْرِجُوكَ وَيَمْكُرُونَ وَيَمْكُرُ اللَّهِ They tried to come up with a different plan, either to kill you or to imprison you or to exile you. وَيَمْكُرُونَ They are planning. وَيَمْكُرُ الله. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also planning. وَاللَّهُ خَيْرُ الْمَاكِرِينَ And Allah is the best of planners. And so the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He informed the Prophet, peace be upon him. The Prophet, He decided that He would leave the city of Mecca. He has to leave. Because now, they wanted to assassinate him. His life was in real danger. And so he called upon whom? He called upon his cousin Ali ibn Abi Talib, the young and brave man. He called him forth and he told him of his plan. He told him that Quraysh are planning to assassinate and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has informed me of this. And so I have to leave. I have to leave the city of Mecca. Are you willing? Are you willing to stay in my place, Ya Ali? 
Amir al-Mu'mineen, he told the Prophet, peace be upon him, he told him, if I stay in your place, will you be safe, Ya Rasulullah? He told him, yes, Allah will protect me. He told him, إِذَنْ نَفْسِي لِنَفْسِكَ الْفِدَى May my soul and my life be a sacrifice for the safety of your life, Ya Rasulullah. If you're going to be safe, then I'm ready to sacrifice myself. And this is exactly what happened. Imam Ali alayhi salam, he slept in the home and in the bed of the Prophet, peace be upon him. The Prophet was able to leave. The Prophet was able to leave in the middle of the night. And then in the morning, when the Quraysh decided in the early morning to attack, they entered and they noticed that the Prophet was gone and that the one who was there was Ali ibn Abi Talib. And so through this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He was able to protect the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and He also protected Imam Ali alayhi salam. The ahadith, very famous Sunni and Shia scholars, they tell us in the ahadith, in the narrations, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He sent Prophet Jibra'il and Prophet Mikail in order to protect Ali ibn Abi Talib, and they did so. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he revealed the verse. He said, And there are some men who sell their lives, who sell themselves for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Ali alayhi salam, he says the value, you know what your value is, O human being? Your value is nothing but heaven. So, so do not sell yourself for anything cheaper than heaven. And there are those who are committed to selling themselves, to dedicating their entire lives to the pleasure and satisfaction of Allah. And this verse, again, according to Shia and Sunni narrators and exegetes, Mufassirin of the Quran, they say that this verse was revealed in favor of Ali ibn Abi Talib and Alayhi salam. This shows us that from the early days, this hero was one who expressed utmost loyalty for the Prophet, peace be upon him. Utmost loyalty. He was ready time and time again. Time, not just once and twice and three times. Over and over again, he was, he put his life on the line in order to protect the, the Prophet, peace be upon him, and the religion of Islam. This was true loyalty. There is a famous hadith by the Prophet where he says, you do not achieve uh, true faith unless what? Unless I, as the Prophet, am more beloved to you than yourself and your family and your spouse and others. When the Prophet is more beloved to us, then we have attained true faith. And the Prophet was the most beloved to Imam Ali alayhi salam. One day a man, he told him, Ya Ali, do you think that you're better than the Prophet? Imam Ali alayhi salam, he answered, he told him, Waihak, innama ana abdun min abidi Muhammad. I am nothing but a servant of Prophet Muhammad. This was the loyalty that Imam Ali alayhi salam had to the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. We have to ask ourselves, brothers and sisters, as we begin this new year, and as we begin this month, the month of Rabi' al-Awwal, we have to reevaluate ourselves and ask ourselves, how much loyalty do we have for the Prophet? How much loyalty and love and sincerity and dedication do we have for the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him? I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the capacity to express true love and dedication to the Prophet and to the religion and to the Ahlul Bayt, alayhim as-salam. Wa akhru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. وأستغفر الله لي ولكم قوموا إلى صلاتكم يرحمكم الله